It backfired, which it normally does. But be patient with me, okay? That's what we're talking about today. We're going to continue in our James series, talking about patience, and we're getting into chapter 5. If you've been with us for a while, you know that um, we're in week 14 now of this series, and um, we're trying to finish this up by Easter, which is in just a few weeks. And so where we've been so far, if you're new to Ecclesia, we've been in this series working through the book of James, and you can find a Bible near you. James is toward the back of it. We'll go ahead and turn there. Um, we've been working through this series that, that is kind of like this idea that we said before, a blueprint for faith in action, because James is very, very practical, just like blueprints, blueprints are. Um, blueprints tell you exactly what to do and where to do it and how to do it and all of those things. And so James is, is pretty much like that. James gives us some very specific instructions on how to live the Christian life. And he's talked about all kinds of stuff. And uh, uh, for those of you that were here last week, you remember we talked about life is a vapor. He said that, listen, to, life is here today and gone tomorrow, okay? And I, I did a presentation from YRMC, and you remember some of you remember me in the video saying, you never know when you're going to show up here. Um, and in fact, some of you work at YRMC and you see people there all the time and people wake up on a Tuesday morning in YRMC having had a, a, an extreme situation. You know, they just wake up there sometimes and they didn't plan on being there on Monday. They didn't say, I think I'll check myself in today to the ER after a horrible accident. Right. You never know. You never know what life is going to bring you. And so what James says, is he says, live the type of life you ought to live every single day because today could be your last. And that's what what we finished up with in James chapter 4. We're going to be getting into James chapter 5, and so if you'll turn there, you'll notice that we're skipping, we're actually going to skip the first six verses, and I know a lot of you are like, why are we doing that? Well, James continues in 1 through 6, continues to talk about something we've already covered twice in 14 weeks, which is the rich and the poor. He's talking about the haves and the have-nots, and the haves ought to treat the have-nots the right way. Okay, and so because I've already talked about that twice, hopefully you got the point. And I pushed forward, if you'll remember, we talked about this a little bit already, this, this specific set of scripture. And so we're going to start in verse 12. We're going we're gonna to finish in three weeks. So this week is patience. Next week, if you'll continue to read, verse 13 talks about prayer. And then we're going to wrap it all up, and then we're going to do Easter. And we're going to start in a new series, which I'm really excited for. I'm talking about my 316, John 316, and how it relates to me and how I can share that with the world around me. So as you might, hopefully you get the kind of gist of, of what I'm getting at today, we're talking about patience, okay? And patience in this world that we live in is fleeing, okay, is absolutely fleeing, and it's vanishing from our culture. If you Think, have any of you seen the Amazon drone that they're working on? That Amazon, you know, the, the, the huge internet provider, um, they're providing products. They're working on a drone that will literally, in certain cities in the U.S., deliver your package within 30 minutes. As long as it's a certain size, it's got, you know, like say you buy a book or whatever, and you, you sign up for Amazon Air, um, literally, a drone picks it up out of the Amazon factory, takes it, there's videos of this online, takes it to your place, you set out in your yard a little paper that has a QR code on it, you set it out there, and Amazon literally has a drone that drops your package right there within a half hour, and then takes off. It's like homing pigeons on steroids, you know what I mean? Like, instead of just a message, it's actually a box. Now, think about this. Years ago, you know, we're talking like pioneer days. There was no getting something in a half hour, right? You're talking months to get something. You got to get on your horse and go into town. And hopefully old Sonny at the mercantile had it. And if he didn't, you had to wait six months to get like our technology and the world that we're living in is getting faster and faster and faster and you no longer have to just go to the mall. You can, I mean, by the time you go to the mall and get in your car and do all that, Amazon could drop a package off for you. Think about how quick technology is making our life. And the reality is, is the quicker that technology gets, the more and more and more impatient we get. How many of you have been on your phone searching something, right? And you're like, you're waiting for the web page to come up 
and it's, you know, it's not there. It's 10 seconds. You can't wait 10 seconds, right, for your web page to come up. You just, you, how many of you have done that? 10 seconds, well, okay, I'm out. Like, I don't know, ain't nobody got no time for 10 seconds, right? It's just, nobody got time for that. It doesn't, it's not going to work. If I got to wait 10 seconds in this culture that I live in, it's not, it's not good for me. I'm just, I'll just do it later, okay? And the, the technology that we have that, that is, and I love technology, hear me, I love it, but it's producing in us more and more impatience. Think about this. We just took the leadership team, uh, seven of us, went to L.A. this week, and we were in the car for like five and a half hours, okay? Now think about your trip with your kids. If you're, you know, my age, my kids have iPads and iPhones and DVDs and, and, and things like that, and now you just put in a DVD, right, and you can go all the way to San Diego on a DVD, right? Kids don't have to do anything. They're just entertained, and they got their iPads and their iDevices and all those things. What did we have, though? If you're my age or older, no iDevices, right? You had iSpy, and that was it. Or dad saying, I am going to pull this car over if you don't shut up, right? That's what we had. And we rode in the back of a car. We rode in the back of the little Hustler, okay, the little tiny pickup truck, and it was bouncing or bouncing around back there. And we're, you know, the only iPad you had was fogging up the windows and drawing on it. Do you know what I mean? Like, that was our iPad. And you rode for hours and hours and hours in the car, and you asked, are we what? Are we there yet? Because that, but listen, that encouraged and it built patience in you, right? It, it in, and now we were at this conference and they said you need to, when you're, when, you're, when you're vision casting and when you're preaching, you need to talk about, you know, concrete numbers. Instead of saying a phone has one gigabyte, say it can store, you know, 10,000 songs, more, you know, more things that people can measure. And so now for our kids, we measure time on trips in television shows. So we, they say, how long is it going to be until we get there? We say, well, it's an hour and a half. So it's three television shows. So think about this. We didn't have any DVDs, okay? We didn't have iPads. If you're older than me, if you're younger than me, some of you are like, what is this world? How would that be, right? How, the, like, how would you survive without Wi-Fi, right? Like, we had nothing growing up in the car, and, and we learned patience. In fact, I can remember in my grandparents' cab over camper riding in that on the way to Big Lake for, so from Phoenix is like, I don't know, five and a half, six hours or whatever. He didn't stop for nothing, okay? There was no stopping. You had to, I'm, I'm going to be a real honest, they had a coffee can that if you had to whiz, you're in the back of a camper trying to whiz in a coffee can. He ain't stopping, okay? You had to just learn how to be patient in that back of the, of the, of the cab over camper. A lot of you have stories. I know you're laughing because some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. The Folger can that's getting too full and you're like, what are we going to do? Right? So we had to learn patience. You had to learn how to hold it. Okay? Hold it. That's kind of a crazy concept today to wait or to be patient for anything. It's something that we've lost in this culture. Okay? And we were playing this game the other night with Lori's... Um, Lori's family, who was in from Illinois, they're all gone now, I think. We were playing that game, Heads Up. Have you ever played that game, Heads Up, on the cell phone? Um, and we were, well, of course you have, Willie, you were playing the other night. You guys played that game, Heads Up, where it's like, um, well, let's just play it really quick. Let's see. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to play it, and uh, I'm going to hold this on my head. This is the category animals. Okay, there's going to be an animal that comes up on the screen, and you have to try to tell me the words or actions or whatever to try to guess what this animal is, okay? So I'm going to play it. This is what we were playing, okay? So tell me, can you see it? What is it? Oh. Shape. It's a red. It's what? Pink and red. Uh, star. Starfish. Okay. Another animal that lives in the ocean. Okay. Hard shell turtle. A uh, crab. Oh, sorry. What, fleas? Uh, ticks? Baseball? Huh? A, fu a, sick a sling blade, sickle? Oh, swordfish. 
Uh, be bugs, uh, ladybugs, pick ants. We're getting closer. It's almost done, huh? Bear, lion, lion king. Okay, we're done. So, you guys did pretty good. I know a lot of you can't see it. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We got six. <coughs> so good job, but. It's an app. It's called Heads Up. Yep, Heads Up, like Heads Up 7 Up. So it's an app on your phone. So we're playing this game. Thanks for playing with me. I love playing that game. We're playing this game the other night with Lori's family, and we were talking about celebrities. And um, there was a celebrity that nobody knew the name. Like, we don't know who that is. So one of Lori's uncles, what does he do, right? He, said, he Googles the name, and within 10 seconds... We get the name of the lady, her picture, all of the movies she's ever, uh, you know, ever been in and where she was born and all of that. Um, I, don't, I don't even remember the name now. I'm, I'm totally lost at this point. But think about this for a second. If you, let's say 15 years ago, if you wanted to know who the Cubs third baseman was in 1974, what did you do? Huh? You didn't Google it, right? There, how would you find out? Like if you're talking with your buddy about the Cubs, right? And, and you want, oh, who was third base? I can't remember that guy in like in the 74 World Series, right? So what would you do then? Go to the library and then look up what? Or it, it, even if you had encyclopedias in your house, the encyclopedia, how many of you had encyclopedias in your house? We did. Yeah, I know the old people, right? The old people had encyclopedias. For those of you that don't know, encyclopedias was like Google on pages, okay? It was a bunch of books, and it told you all kinds of information, but it wouldn't tell you who the Cubs third baseman was in 74. So then you just have to like either go to the library and try to figure it out or call that friend who you know is a Cubs friend or like phone a friend. It would take you weeks, right? Weeks to find out who the Cubs third baseman was. Right now, literally in five seconds, I can tell you, we're becoming more and more impatient, okay? It's just a reality. As, and patience is fleeing with technology. Think about this. Do you remember... Those of you that are older, mixtapes, do you remember making mixtapes off the radio, yeah. right? Mixtapes off the radio. You had to be really, really patient. So for those of you, before there were iPods, okay, there were boom boxes and cassette tapes. And you couldn't just download information like the other day. Check this out. Lori and I were on the way to Mexico. We're in literally the middle of nowhere, hundreds of miles from any civilization. And we are stopped at the border. And Lori is downloading Justin Bieber songs to our phone within five or ten seconds. We immediately had the song that we wanted. Okay. You go back about 20, 30 years, okay, when we, and I know some of you are way older than me, you're like, you don't even know about this. We had the phonograph, but even the cassette tape, when you wanted to make a cassette tape for your girl, right, a mixtape, today mixtape takes you 10 seconds, okay, then it took so much patience because you're waiting for the DJ, you're waiting for, you're just waiting for that song to come on and waiting and waiting and hoping you're right there by the record button because as soon as he'd play it and you hear it, oh, you have to hit record. And if you didn't hit it fast enough, what? You got to wait again, right? It was just waiting and waiting and waiting. And it taught us patience, okay? Something <clears throat> that is fleeing in the society. Hopefully I've made my case enough, right, that we live in an impatient world. I remember when we started downloading music off Napster illegally, okay, I'm just going, and it would take like 30 minutes to download one song, and then you burned it to a CD, which was real time, we had a one speed CD burner, which mean if the, if the CD was an hour and a half long, it took you an hour and a half to burn it. And then I remember my dad, he got a two speed CD, and we were like, yeah! right and then he, and then an eight speed came out and we got an eight speed and it was so awesome we didn't have to be as patient anymore we're totally think about this totally impatient people impatience though can impatience can get you in trouble okay think about the financial problems relational problems 
that impatience gets young people in. Think about the people that you know, young married couples that, you know, they just got to have a house or they got to have that car or they got to have whatever it is and they don't want to save money. And so what do they do? They go and they buy something on credit before they can afford it and they lose it and they lose the home or whatever because they can't really afford it, but they want it now and then they're broke or they want to experience whatever it is relationally with their boyfriend or girlfriend, so they jump into a sexual relationship before marriage, and it ruins everything, friends. We can learn some great things by being patient. Hopefully, I've made my case. Let's look at James chapter 5, verse 7 through 12. I've got it up on the screen up here. James chapter 5. This is where James is now talking about being patient. Let's see what James has to say about it. James 7, or sorry, chapter 5, verse 7. It says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it, until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Verse 9. Do not complain, brethren, against one another. So that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is coming or is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Verse 11. This is our last slide. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings and that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Now, James talks about three areas, three types of patience that are a little bit different, okay? And they're honestly quite different than the patience that we've been talking about. He talks about these three areas that, number one, we need to patiently await the Lord's return. That's what he talks about in the first section. So if you're a note taker, these are the notes that you ought to take, okay? Then number two is we need to deal patiently with others. And then he finishes up this text with be patient because God is working in you, okay? So let's look at that first one, patiently await the Lord's return. This is what he says in in verse 7 through 8. This is where he's talking about this. It says, Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Every minute that passes, we're getting closer to the Lord's return. You're closer now to God's return than you were when you walked through the door. It's a reality. So that's not just a hope. My friends, that is a reality. We're closer and closer and getting closer and closer to Christ's return. When John was an old man, okay, and God had revealed to him the things of the future in Revelation, God reveals to John, these are the things that are going to happen. This is how it's going to go down. Here's what I'm going to do in the future. We read about this in Revelation, what John saw. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away. And there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Three, and I heard a loud voice from the the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, for the first things have passed away. Yes, I cannot wait for the day of my Lord's return where I can sit next to my Father. There's no more pain. There's no more sorrow. There's no more work. There's no more heartache. There's no more sin. It's me and my daddy right there, and I get to enjoy the presence of God fully. Friends, we're closer right now than when we had walked in here. I have this seminary professor on on Mondays, my seminary professor, his grandma 
Um, he tells a story about his grandma, who, who I, don't, I don't think she's still alive, but she would constantly just be at home and praying over her prayer list, like the things that she was supposed to be praying for and reading her Bible. And they'd say, Grandma, let's go to dinner. I believe she were, she's in El Paso. She lives in El Paso. And they said, let's go to dinner. And Grandma would say, okay, well, I'm going to go to dinner, but you got to bring me right back. And they would take her to dinner, and she'd be fine at dinner. And they'd say, Grandma, let's go to Dairy Queen. And she's like, no, I need to get back home. I need to get back to my reading, to my studying, to my prayer. Praying, I don't want Jesus to come back. Find me eating ice cream instead of praying over my prayer list. Now, that's kind of an extreme example, okay, for sure. But it gives us the question, is the thing that I'm doing, the type of life that I'm living, it's a question that you ought to ask yourself all day long. Am I, what I'm doing right now, is this something that if Christ's word to return right now, I'd either be praised for or I'd be embarrassed about, right? Think about it. Or the things that we're doing, this goes back to like last week, right? Talking about the life is a vapor. We ought to live our lives for Christ fully, doing his will and not our own because he's coming back for us. It's not just a hope. It is a reality, friends. The next thing that he shares is he says, we need to deal patiently with each other, okay? With our brothers and sisters. Now, this is a different type of patience that he talks about. And in fact, from chapter 4, this is kind of just a continuation, right? Because chapter 4, he said, don't judge, right? He said, don't put other people's problems in front of yours. Remember, we looked at the text, take the log out of your own eye before you take out the speck in your other, in the, your brother's eye. We talked about this extensively in chapter 4, James here is just echoing what he's already said. He's saying, listen, deal patiently with the people around you. He's saying, give people a break. Give them some slack. Give them some grace. Look at what he says there. The, the text is down here. Do not, do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. Listen, we, as believers in Christ, have been given much grace. Remember that illustration a few years ago, pouring Tootsie Rolls all over, um, all over Wayne, just overwhelming him with Tootsie Rolls of grace. Like that's the picture. You are you have been overwhelmed with grace and mercy and forgiveness and love. Listen, God is pouring out those things on you. How dare us, right? How dare us not be patient with others? It says, he says here that the judge is at the door, right? A lot of us will come in here and we're kind of looking around, right? We're just, we're sitting there and we're looking around like, oh yeah, I remember what she did. I'm not as bad as her, right? I remember, I remember that Facebook post. I've seen that. She's, okay, I got her covered. Oh yeah, that dude, ah, he cheated on his wife a few years ago. I'm better than him, right? We do this. We, we, look, we look around and we say, yeah, I think I'm, I'm doing all right. Right. I'm OK. Right. My stuff don't stink. Right. And in the back, the judge who knows all things is looking at you and saying, you ain't that good, buddy. Right. I have I've seen it all. Right. I know you. I know the innermost parts of you. OK. And I still love you. That's what he says to us. He says, I know the innermost parts of you. I know your deepest, darkest secrets. And I still love you. And I've still given my life for you, right? So how dare you? So it's like he's in, the, he's in the back saying, listen, don't be impatient with people. Don't be, you know, don't be angry with people when they're too slow to answer your questions. Don't, d listen, don't hold their sin over their heads. Offer them grace and mercy and love because that's what you've been given. That's what James is getting at here. This is... The text for us today. Don't just think your hot stuff, right? If you remember, we shared a few years ago, or I'm sorry, a few months ago, that story in Matthew chapter 18. If, if you're not familiar with the Bible, I suggest you go sometime this week to Matthew chapter 18. There's a story there, okay, that talks about this idea. There's a story that Jesus shares about a king who, uh, there's these two slaves, and the one slave owns the king millions of dollars, okay? 
And the king says, it's time to pay up. It's time to, you know, like you, I've loaned you this money. It's time to pay up. The slave can't pay up. And he says, and so the king says, throw him into the dungeon. Do away with him. And the slave says, king, please forgive me of the debt. Forgive me. I'll pay you back. I'll pay you back. I'll just do whatever you got to do. Just, you know, don't kill me. Don't, don't send me to prison. And the king looked with compassion on the slave and said, you know what? I'm going to forgive that debt. Walk out of here free and clear. King was gracious to the slave. Jesus says that same slave, after being offered grace and forgiveness, being forgiven this huge debt, runs immediately to a fellow slave who owes him $100 and starts choking him and saying, give me my money you owe me, right? The people see what happens. The people know that this slave had just been forgiven millions of dollars of debt and now is holding another slave captive over just a hundred bucks. They tell the king, and the king says, bring that wicked slave in here. Throw him into the dungeon. Never let him be seen again. You've been forgiven much, so you go and forgive much. Okay? That's what James is getting at here. Jesus echoes those things in Matthew chapter 18. Lastly, James says, let's be patient because God is working. Okay? Be patient, God is working. There's things that he's got going on that you don't know about. Look at how James closes this text. It says here, verse 10, As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. This is really just a continuation of chapter 1, where James was talking about suffering through trials. Do you remember that? We talked about trials and temptation. The trials come from God. Temptations come from who? Satan, right? And the trials are designed to make you stronger, better. They're designed to make you more godly, more wise. Temptations are from Satan designed to make you what? To make you sin, okay? This is what James is continuing to say. Look at what he said there in chapter 1. This is what we, I think, our second week in our series. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Listen, some of you are in bad situations right now, okay? And honestly, for some of you, I'm sure it's, it, you're just living with the consequence of your own bad actions, okay? You've made bad decisions, and so now you're paying the consequences. Others of you are in situations that are horrible, and it's nothing you did, okay? external things that have happened to you, okay? There's people in both situations here. Remember, God wants to use those trials to produce wisdom and endurance and strength. And here what James is talking about, patience in you, okay? God is using those things. He will, if you allow God to use those difficult situations in your life, okay? When you're in those things, in our conference that we just came back from, one of the preachers up there said, it's not the question when you're going through crap to ask God why. That's the wrong question. You ask God what. When you're going through all the crap that's happening, you ask God instead of why, God, you ask him what. What do you want me to learn? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to learn from this situation? How do you want me to grow? We don't ask why. We ought to be asking what does it hurt yes okay does it suck yes okay but god will produce in you through suffering he'll produce endurance he'll produce patience he'll produce wisdom if you ask him if you run to him and say god this situation sucks i hate it give me endurance give me patience Give me wisdom. The text says that he will whenever you ask. I know some of you probably know the story of Job, which is what uh, James talks about here. You know, you may be in a bad situation, and I can pretty confidently say that your situation is nothing compared to the story of Job. 
If you know the story of Job, Job had, I mean, blessed dude, lots of kids, lots of money, lots of everything. And in a matter of 20 minutes, he literally lost all of his kids, all of his stuff, lost his health, lost everything, okay? Lost everything. And through that experience, he still never ran from God. He continued to run to God. And he said, God, you've given me, and now you've taken it back. Blessed be your name. He was patient, and he endured, okay? And he didn't curse God. He said, God, give me the wisdom to see what's going on. Give me the endurance to endure this thing. Give me the patience, okay, to deal with these circumstances. And somehow, God blessed him tenfold on the other side of it. How does that even work? I don't know, okay? Honestly, I don't know. But Job was patient. He allowed God to work. There's a phrase or a terminology for God that says God is sovereign, you guys know what that word is? Sovereign means that God, he's got it under control. He's in control. Whether it really looks like it or not, he's got it in control. God can make good out of bad. God can make healing out of pain. God can make right out of wrong. Okay? He is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's sovereign. Whatever he wants to happen, happens in this world that we live in. You can trust him. Be patient. He's working. Okay? He's working. So this is what James tells us. These are the three things. He says, let's patiently await the Lord's return. He's coming. Christ is coming. Okay? Let's live like he's coming. Then deal patiently with others. When those people in the Walmart parking lot, and you know that's where I get, like at Walmart, that's when my patience goes out the window. Okay? Okay? Oh, my goodness. It's like I have a patience meter, and it just pings right then at Walmart. When you're, you're like, I was there. The, oh, my, I'm not even going to tell you the story because I'll probably get fired or whatever. But anyway, like, like, let's deal patiently with each other, okay? Because you've been forgiven, forgive. Because you've been offered grace, be gracious, okay? And then also be patient. God is working in those times, those situations, those things that really suck. Listen, he's allow him to work. Don't run from it. Run to him in those situations because he's got it under control. I'm going to pray for the offering. Worship team, you guys can come forward. I, I just want to pray today as we close that God, I mean, I'm not even going to pray that he deals patiently with us because he already is. I mean, he already has. If, you, if you're like me, I mean, I can't even fathom the amount of patience that Christ has to have with me because I mess up time and time again. I don't do what I ought to. For 25 years of my life, I spurred his love and his grace and his mercy, and I just ran from him. I denied the gifts that he was trying to give me. And then came the day where I said, God, I'm done running from you. I give my life to you. Change me from the inside out. I, I admit I'm a sinner, and I know I need forgiveness. Forgive me and make me new. There, there was that moment for me, like 16 years ago or whatever, where God radically transformed me through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I... I just pray that if you've never experienced that type of transformation, that you just, you just ha say a prayer to God like that. I mean, there's no magic words. There's no handshake that you would just say, God, I've run from you for too long, and I want to come home. I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Make me a new creation. I turn away from that old life start living for you Jesus I believe you're the son of God you came you you lived you died you rose again all in order to pay my penalty for sin I ask for you to save me if you'll pray that type of prayer or have that type of conversation with God the scripture says that the Holy Spirit will literally indwell you and he'll change you and if you were for whatever reason like we talked about 
a few minutes ago. For whatever reason, if you did not wake up tomorrow, you'd be waking up in the arms of your Savior. God, I pray for any...